just a minute. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Emma Cormack. I'm an associate curator here at BGC and one of the three co-curators of the Threads of Power exhibition down the street, um, organized in collaboration with the Textile Museum St. Gallen. I'm so pleased to welcome you to Making Lace Global Networks Symposium today, organized in conjunction with the exhibition where we'll listen to four presentations about various hand lace making techniques from around the world. So first off, I'd like to thank our excellent public humanities and research team for organizing this event today, Andrew Kircher. Laura Minsky and Nadia Rivers back at the back there on that elevated table. Um, and thank you to our security and facilities teams too for ensuring that we can hold this event on, uh, in person today and also to our tech team for um, ensuring that our audience outside of New York can watch online. Um, I'd also like to express our appreciation to the Kobe Foundation and their generous support of the Threads of Power exhibition and their ongoing support of the work BGC does here. Um, thank you to the Consulate General of Switzerland Switzerland Tourism, and Forster Owner for their generosity and friendship. And we're grateful for support from the National Endowment for the Arts for this project, as well as for support from the Zurich Silk Association, the Lenore G. Tawney Foundation, ACRIS, the Finger Lakes Lace Guild, and the New England Lace Group, among others. And finally, I'd like to specifically thank Elena Kanagi laux who's here in the front row. She made the beautiful red silk bobbin lace collar that opens the exhibition down the street. Um, Elena is at the center of our waist, uh, excuse me, at the center of our lace web. Um, and we're so grateful for her ongoing collaboration and for so generously sharing her expertise and connections with other historians and lace makers in the US and abroad. Thank you. So um, one thing that working on this project with the Textile Museum St. Gallen, our BGC faculty and students and the wider community of lace makers has made abundantly clear is that the world of lace making is very vast and that our discussion of European lace making is one facet of a much larger lace constellation. For centuries, cultures around the world have produced open work and other lace-like textiles using a variety of knotting, braiding, twisting, weaving adjacent techniques, um, relying on different tools to produce stunningly complex pieces by hand. So in studying the history of lace, one large element of the story is often missing, and that is the lives and stories of the lace makers themselves. Um, one of the most fruitful outcomes of the Threads of Power exhibition for me and Michelle has been um, what we call our Lace Makers Studio down the street on the fourth floor of BGC's gallery. Every weekend afternoon, you can finish a visit to the exhibition by spending time in the studio where on any given day between three and seven Brooklyn Lace Guild members are working around the table. Some of the members specialize in techniques you'll see featured in the galleries, but it doesn't stop there. Um, on display in the room, you'll see various examples of other types of open work and lace techniques, tatting, spraying, etc. And if you're lucky enough, you'll see someone at work who is happy to share their practice with you and give you a new appreciation for the immense time and skill it makes to produce these objects. A focus on the maker has been a core tenant of this project, where we may have shockingly well-preserved examples of the objects lace makers of the past have made. We don't often have information about them as people and as skilled artists who so very often spent their lives learning and perfecting these sophisticated skills. That's why I'm so pleased to welcome Kasuni, Anna, Lily, and Emma today, who are makers themselves and who have so generously agreed to share their expertise with us so that we all might be brought further into the global lace web. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague and co-curator, Michelle Major, so that she can introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, so I will be introducing the speakers uh, one at a time. So starting off with Kasuni. Uh, Kasuni Rathmasurya was born on the southern coast of Sri Lanka and her work is informed and inspired by the country's Portuguese and Dutch cultural heritage and the rich island life that takes place along its many beaches. Ratna Surya began her studies in biology, but changed her, her focus to design, and graduated from the Academy of Design in Colombo, Sri Lanka in 2007. In 2011, she launched her one-of-a-kind one clothing line, Kerr. Kerr supports sustainable approaches in the fashion business, such as revitalizing dyeing crafts like the Biralu lace tradition in Sri Lanka and advocates for makers and their communities. Also in 2011, she received the prestigious Young Fashion Entrepreneur Award from the British Council. 
The award is an initiative offered in partnership with the Sri Lanka Design Festival that champions and celebrates the importance of creative entrepreneurs in the 25 to 35, 35 age category working in the field of fashion. Um, also in 2011, uh, Ratna Surya was a finalist for the Ethical Fashion Award in Sri Lanka. Ratna Surya has showcased her work at New York Fashion Week, South Bank London, and at venues in Australia. Her work has been featured in many publications, including Vogue, Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, Women's Wear Daily, and a recent New York Times article about men and lace. Her talk is entitled, Reemergence of Artisanal Handmade Lace in Ready to Wear, The Story of Kerr. Please welcome Kasuni Rathnasurya. Thank you, Michelle, for the very kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Reemergence of artisanal handmade bobbin lace in ready to wear. Um, this is the story of Kerr. Let me start with Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka is also known as Ceylon. Uh, most of the time I used to get this question of asking whether Sri Lanka is part of India or is it within India. So Sri Lanka is geographically located in Indian Ocean. Um, as, as for the shape, due to the shape of this island, it's called either a uh, pearl in the Indian Ocean or teardrop of the Indian Ocean. So you know that is Sri Lanka. And as you can see, there are a lot of emojis um, on the map. So it's a very compact and diverse island. Um, of course, democratic socialist republic country, um, a member of Commonwealth. Population is about 22 million, which is smaller. Um, the main language is English. And most of the people speak Sinhalese, that is the native language. Um, Okay, so this, here are some of the interesting facts about Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka is known for few good things. Um, the Ceylon tea um, is one of the best teas in the world. And as you can see, the three ladies are plucking tea leaves in a tea estate. Um, so this part of the country is cold. So British used to call this area Little England. Um, and then the wildlife Sri Lanka is also known for some of the exotic wild animals. You can do a lot of safaris. Um, Sri Lanka has inherited beautiful colonial architecture. Uh, one of the movement is called tropical modernism. And of course, Sri Lanka is known for some of the beautiful beaches, as you know by now. Um, also, the island is known for some of the uh, rarest blue sapphire gems that Princess Diana's engagement ring was created using Ceylon Blue Sapphire, uh, currently worn by Princess Kate Middleton, and also True Cinnamon, that uh, you can find uh, one of the best and authentic cinnamons in Sri Lanka. Okay, let's go to the 16th century. Uh, 1505, Portuguese arrived to Sri Lanka. Portuguese have thought they have arrived in India, but then they have realized they have arrived in this different island. Um, they have been overwhelmed by the uh, native people's welcome. And at this time period, there were conflicts among the kingdoms of Sri Lanka. So Portuguese have been uh, smart enough to uh, use those conflicts to gain the power of the country. They used to be really good traders, and they were looking for some of the exotic spices in this region, as you saw, that Sri Lanka is known for some of the authentic cinnamon, so they have somehow uh, ended up in Sri Lanka. And the 17th century, Dutch arrived to Sri Lanka. Here's the highlight of the presentation, that Sri Lankans credit Portuguese of introducing bobbin lace making. So this is the most um, uh, significant uh, evidence that bobbin lace is called Biralu Renda in Sinhalese. So Renda is not a Sinhalese word, it's a Portuguese word. Even now we call Renda, and Portuguese also call Renda, and the word Biralu is also a Portuguese word which is derived from uh, Portuguese language. So Bilro Renda, that's what Portuguese call, and Biralu Renda is what Sinhalese call. So as you can see, the bobbin pillows were quite larger during this time. Um, and uh, 
there are about at least 70 to 100 bobbins on the bobbin pillow and they were working on quite larger projects. Um, the 18th century British arrived to Sri Lanka and British have been fond of this industry as well. And you see the postcard, it's an actual postcard which was sent to France during the British time period. So you see that they have been fond of these industries and they have supported these industries. So the culture, the women's clothing, before Portuguese arrival, as per Sri Lankan monarchy, there was a social class system. Lowest caste, men and women were not required to cover the top part of their bodies, which is a quite a disturbing fact, and you won't see this practice anywhere <laughs> right now. But this has been one of the reasons that certain communities in the society didn't have access to this skill and the craftsmanship, because they didn't have the access to certain type of clothing. And in the second photograph that you see, a lady is wearing a white cotton shirt, which we call white cotton blouse, um, and she's wearing that with a sarong. And the, the other lady is just covering her chest area with a piece of clothing and wearing a sarong. The third photograph that you see, uh, Sinhalese fruit sellers. The ladies are wearing simple cotton blouse, no embellishment ne on necklines or hemlines, just sarong. And you see very simple, minimal um, necklace, like very simple, minimal aesthetics. And even the gentleman on the photograph that you see, he's wearing a simple white shirt and a sarong. So this is the Sri Lankan DNA, more for under, uh, understated, very less is more um, aesthetics. And here is the British, Portuguese and Dutch inspiration. Uh, the first painting that you see, an aristocratic woman is dressed up and then the other lady is wearing a white cotton shirt, a blouse. But now you can see there's a little bit of embellished neckline. Um, and on the other two sketches also you can see the influence came from colonial time period. Um, you see the volume on the sleeve, the highly embellished necklines and hemlines, little bit of ruffles on the sleeves, and now they are wearing skirts instead of the um, sarong. So this is the inspiration and it's quite significant. Here's the lace industry. On the first photograph that you see most of the women in different, different age groups that they are engaging in some sort of sewing work. So this has been a practice in any household that women used to do some sort of a sewing work. Like it could be needle lace, applique, um, touching, crochet, uh, or basic simple uh, sewing work. Um, and on the second photograph that you see uh, women I working on bobbin pillows. So now you see how they dress and also the bobbin pillows are quite larger. Usually they do this uh, larger project where they do bobbin or lower bobbin lace for a tabletop covers or uh, to decorate the tabletops or even to um, decorate their bedrooms uh, and on top of the bed covers that they used to lay these beautiful bobbin lace pieces. Um, as you can see, the boys and men are just posing for the photograph. Uh, so there's no evidence that uh, men have engaging in bobbin lace making. So it's quite significant that it's a very um, common uh, household work. Uh, the three young ladies are working on bobbin pillows and it has been a common practice and also it's kind of a way of life that people used to engaging in this craft uh, for a long time. This is the evolution and this is quite important as well that now you see the ladies are wearing white blouses, highly embellished with bobbin lace on the neckline, on the hemlines. And then you see the second photograph, I just wanted to emphasize that this is the South Indian influence now you saw the South, uh, Sri Lankan influence, which is a very minimal DNA, and uh, all those heavy accessories, um, the nose rings, the beautiful way of draping saris, where direct influence came from South India. The moment we hear South Asian fashion, we think about colors, obviously thanks to India, because of the very rich, rich textile and beautiful and rich accessories. 
but Sri Lanka has been quite a contrast. It has been very simple and minimal and white and beige and very simple color palette. Um, on the third photograph is, um, is after the um, independence that Sri Lanka gained the independence in 1948 from the British. Um, the four, after that, Sri Lanka became a very free country. Um, the lady who is sitting on the stool is my beloved mother. And whenever she used to tell us not to wear short skirts, we used to show this. <laughs> so um, now you know 16th century, 17th, 18th, and you know a little bit of our Sri Lanka. So here's the modern um, or present circumstances. 2011, I've decided to come up with my own clothing line. So I wanted a one syllable name. So I came up with initials of my full name, K-U-R, Kasuni Utpala Ratnasurya. And thanks to a little bit of French education that I had in middle school, I wanted to get an accent. So I made it Ka. Um, and if you are familiar with bobbin, bobbins and bobbin lace, the letter U, at the top of the letter U, it's a bobbin. So that the idea is the brand will always carry a bobbin lace incorporated clothing. Um, I always wanted to create a unique product. At that time, I didn't have this knowledge. I didn't have this exposure. I was just a young graduate. But anyway, I wanted to preserve this craft. So I thought the only way to preserve this craft while incorporating them into contemporary fashion. Um, and then women empowerment is something that I've been doing from the day one. Uh, throughout this journey, I've been meeting some of the amazing women, all the lace makers, all the women who are working with me, um, most of the time have empowered me, and the inclusivity representation does matter. Um, it's, a, it's a DNA of the brand. Uh, for a bobbin lace that I mainly use cotton, cotton thread. As we all know, cotton is a very water-hungry industry. So I make sure that I work with responsible partners in supply chain. I always work with very small scale boutique mills in Japan and India. And the traceability is something currently I'm working on. I'm planning to incorporate a QR code for my product. So you can scan the code and you can find out who created your products. Sorry. Okay. Um, here are some of the milestones of my brand launched in 2011 and 2011 I gained this recognition from British Council. I was um, able to showcase my work in South Bank London and then in New York and um, I do believe in collaboration. Um, that is the only way we can create something unique. Um, and some of the product launches and of course 2022 is still processing. Uh, here are my bobbin lace makers from Sri Lanka. I've been working with them for many years. Uh, this is one of the small lace centers. Apart from that, there are lace, make lace makers in the area. Those who are doing uh, work from home, they do lace making from home. The lace center has these lace experts. These ladies are fourth generation, third generation lace weavers. They are grandmothers used to teach them and the mothers used to teach them. It's something transferring like that. Um, these are some of the common bobbin lace patterns in Sri Lanka. Jasmine flower, sunflower, uh, but the sunflower is not very common in Sri Lanka. So we do believe that this is a direct influence from Dutch, perhaps Portuguese, um, and the little fly shape and some of the geometrical shapes. So these are very effective for any lace maker who's engaging in lace making in Sri Lanka. Okay, so the connecting dots is quite important for me because of the huge Dutch and Portuguese, the European influence as well as British influence. And these are some of my initial work that when I wanted to create a collection, um, I had to look at the native uh, Sri Lankan part as well as the, uh, the European influence. Uh, this is how I engineer my products and I time to time go back and forth and evolve the product. So it's all about evolving the product and creating something for the modern time. Oh, sorry. Okay, so these are some of my work starting from 2015. Uh, one of the things that I've did differently since the inception that I injected bobbin lace stripes 
into a silhouette and I created very unusual placements. Uh, most of the time that we have seen bobbin lace on either necklines or hemlines or on ruffles, but this was a quite a difference that I started creating. Okay, so this is a seasonless collection. I do create mainly two main collections per year, spring, summer, fall, winter, but the nightwear was quite special. Most of the ladies, they do love nightwear. I guess uh, the bobbin lace really complements these beautiful nightwear pieces. And I've been carrying this product category for a few years now. Spring Summer 2021 is a very important collection. This was created during 2020, uh, during the pandemic year, which was very challenging. And I really wanted to create a collection. The reason was that most of the bobbin lace makers were about to give up their skill. Uh, at this time, I really wanted to work with them and I wanted to support them and also I wanted to continue this craft. Um, one of the reasons and one of the motivations behind this collection was this stilt fisherman. So this stilt fishing is only exist in Sri Lanka. This has started during the uh, post-World War II as a result of food scarcity that people have decided to go and just fish for themselves. Um, this is a disappearing practice. So you won't see this um, very common, even in Sri Lanka. Just a very few steel fishermen are um, in, the, in, the, in the country right now. Um, even during 1995, the American photographer Steve McCurry, he has documented this and even he has um, emphasized that these practices will get disappeared. So my idea was that if we let go during the pandemic, if we let go this uh, craft and um, we will not see that again. So I decided to work with lace makers and I commissioned most of the bobbin lace makers to do this motif and uh, we created a little storyline and I started collecting all the bobbin lace from all the um, lace makers who were doing lace making and um, we, we were we were we could uh, pay a little extra and created more value and uh, this time it was really helpful some helpful for some of the lace makers so it was a quite an emotional collection but then somehow uh, here we are now we are in 2022 um, this is the last slide of my presentation the future of handmade lace i do believe that future of handmade lace is in good hands in our hands um, there's a growing demand from the new generation, especially the young generation, the Gen Z and young millennials are heavily um, into appreciating craft and uh, sustainability and climate change movement also supports the craftsmanship and forgotten uh, art forms and crafts. And also some of the best things are happening. The Threads of Power exhibition is one to credit. Um, yes, we do. Uh, uh, featured in New York Times article, which was again a great thing. Thanks to some of the ladies in this forum as well. Um, so on, on that high note, I would like to conclude my presentation. I believe the future is brighter in terms of craftsmanship and all the lace makers. So let's watch this video and you will see some of the last remaining steel fishermen from Sri Lanka um, and some of the bobbin lace makers and the collection that I created during 2020 um, uh, and well, yes, this is a very important um, uh, video and we created during that time, during August 2020, um, I was based in here and my team was back in Sri Lanka. So it was a quite a challenging time, but um, it's, it's, the, it's a collection called Hope. So thank you so much.
for that really wonderful talk. It was really interesting and, and very inspiring and very moving. And I especially like seeing the sketch your sketches and how they incorporate historical and different cultural influences. I, I, I'd like to see that sketch again or those couple of, ske couple of sketches again. Um, and um, just to uh, reiterate, uh, maybe for those out on the internet, <laughs> out there, um, that we're holding uh, Q&A till the end. So we'll have the four presentations and then we'll have um, a question. So I hope you're noting questions if you have them as we go along for the speakers. Um, our next speaker is Ana Andrade. Uh, Ana Andrade is a designer, researcher, and entrepreneur who advocates for social welfare and sustainability causes in the fashion and textile industries. She devised the business model for Veridas after completing her university thesis at Central St. Martin's London in 2019. For this venture, she received a prestigious and highly competitive startup visa that was endorsed by the University of the Arts London in collaboration with the British government Home Office. Currently, Andrade spends her time between her business and design practice and conducting research towards her master's degree in social anthropology at the University of Oxford, which focuses on material culture and the, and the anthropology of craft. Her talk is entitled Co-Designing with Lace Makers in Northeastern Brazil. Please welcome Ana Andrade. Well, hi everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, thanks to the Bard Graduate Center. Um, thank you, Emma and Laura, for the back and forth of emails, Elena, um, and the wonderful curators of the exhibition and the artists and the other speakers. Um, it's an honor to be here with you guys today. Um, so yeah, as said in the introduction, my name is Anne Andrade. I'm a designer and anthropologist. Um, with um, working, my work focuses on the anthropology of craft and cultural heritage, um, specifically in Brazil and Latin America. I work in the fashion industry and have worked in the industry for over a decade now. And within fashion, my areas of interest are sustainability, um, the preservation of the environment, and particularly workers' welfare. And I am the person behind Veredas, um, the company, although it's weird to call it a company because it's really just me. Um, um, but it's anyway, Veredas has been the platform where I've been able to make a lot of my interests and passions come together and converge. Um, so just to give a quick overview of what Veredas is and what we do. Um, we are a sustainability and yeah, we can play the video as well. It's like a little introduction video. Um, yeah, so we are a sustainability and design consultancy. Besides being a brand, um, I think if you go online, you see a lot of the brand work that we do. Um, and we bridge the gap between um, artisan communities in Brazil to the high-end designer market. Um, my focus really is on researching and developing textiles and artisanal products with these communities and then both through the brand and through the consultancy, bringing them in different avenues to the design industries. Um, so on one hand, we are tackling a lot of the issues that the design industries face in regards to sustainability, um, material sourcing, traceability of supply chain, and workers' welfare on one hand, while at the same time um, supporting these communities and their local economies, um, supporting the preservation of cultural heritage and traditional crafts in Brazil, um, improving a lot of these artisans' um, living and working conditions, and also opening channels and new markets, not for them, but with them. Um, the video goes for longer, but you, you can see the full version on the website. And this is just a little summary of what I just said. Um, Yeah, so today I will be talking particularly about lace making in the northeastern coast of Brazil, um, in the district of Akiras, which is marked on the map, um, in Ceará state. Um, the whole northeastern coast of Brazil is known for its diversity of traditional crafts and textiles and different lace techniques, but my passion and focus has always been bobbin lace. 
Um, this is just a little video showing more of what bobbing lace in Brazil looks like. I think it's really interesting to highlight that although bobbin lace is a practice that's done worldwide and it was brought over to Brazil by European colonizers, um, in Brazil, discourses around lace making and bobbin lace deem it as primarily Brazilian. Like there's very little links made to its European heritage and um, like local governments and the tourism industry really narrate it as something that is ours. And I think it's really interesting when you look at the materials of the craft, um, you see a lot of how it has arrived in Brazil and become really part of the country and the culture. You can see that the, um, can I play the video again actually? Sorry, because I was short. But you can see how the bobbins have little coconuts at the at their ends and the pins are thorns that are picked out of um, cactus plants that grow naturally in the region. Um, the lace pillows are stuffed with like dried banana tree leaves or like the banana uh, hay, I think, or maybe how to call it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to call it in Portuguese, sorry, and in English. But yeah, so I think it's interesting how both discursively but materially the craft has really um, been incorporated and absorbed into Brazilian culture and identity. Um, so moving on, um, I would like to just talk a little bit about the production of lace through veredas um, and really just share with you a little bit of my, <coughs> excuse me, design approach and philosophy which is also reflected in my um, academic work. Um, that is how to work with traditional crafts and how to make that bridge between traditional crafts and like a, a crazy evolving, constant change in design industry. <clears throat> and I think that, I mean, that's a tough question to answer in this time frame, but I'll do my best to cover at least some of the grounds. So in this picture, you see Grassimar, um, a lace maker in Akiras, and also a pattern drafter, which is a skill that's sort of like a dying skill within the lace making communities of Ceará. And it's a very important skill because these are the people that kind of draft different lace pattern and lace stitches combinations and uh, trade them with lace makers. That's what sort of allow lace makers to continue producing new pieces and keep their crafts sort of thriving. So Grassimar is an incredible and a very important person, and she's a dear friend of mine. I met her years ago when Veredas was still just like a dream, and I was like in my final year of undergrad um, doing, you know, research and de development for my final collection. And this is just one of the many pictures of us working together in what I call co-designing, because it is really a process of back and forth, talking and exchanging of ideas and knowledge and, you know, about design and the patterns and so forth. Um, I think before I go more into what I mean by co-designing, I think it's important to contextualize the discourses around the idea of craft and of lace making. Um, and I say discourses not just in like the, the popular understanding of what craft or lace making is, but you also see that reflected on academic writing about craft. Um, people often deem craft something that's made by hand or that requires skill in making. Um, craft is often narrated as something that speaks of utility and function. So it's like something that's made for an end. Um, uh, discourses of craft often understand it as things that are made of a certain range of materials. Um, and then the things that speak of the tradition. And there's also ideas about like who are artisans and who are the people behind craft production. Um, and usually these ideas can be linked to like notions of a time, usually the past, like a pre-industrial, pre-capitalist time. Um, identities of artisans are often linked to specific geographic locations, often outside of the Western capitalist centers. Um, that also gives certain ideas about ethnicities of artisans and craft makers and lace makers. And also gender, although this is a huge topic I won't be able to cover, but like there's tons of ideas about um, women and textile production and confinements into the household and so forth. So all of these things kind of shape our understanding of what craft is or should be. 
Um, craft is often narrated as like an opposition to modernization and industrialization, and oftentimes narrated as like a contrast to the fine art or the art world, oftentimes is like a lesser practice because it's linked to functionality or it's not allegedly creative or something like that. And I mean, needless to say, I of course I disagree with a lot of this, um, but I, I don't even think it's worth engaging in a discussion of whether these notions are true or not. We will see that some of them are more or less true or historically explainable. Um, but my work has been really interested in seeing what else can there be outside of the boxes of these definitions or between those lines. Um, the main problem I see with the, these dis discourses is that they, they create a false dichotomy between the traditional and the modern, where they're as if they were completely separate spheres. And a lot of the times, especially in academic writing, you see artists, like, like discourses around artisans um, kind of locking them in into either one or the other, or Sometimes they're narrated as this like heroic resistance to the modern and to capitalism. And sometimes they're narrated as almost like victims that are being assimilated into this production system. And the problem of that discourse is that it um, removes the idea of artisans' own ag agency in shaping and recreating their own identities in the modern times as inhabitants of the modern world like the present. Um, so a lot of my design philosophy kind of it, like it goes, be, you know, it's motivated by that. Um, these are just some pictures of my work. I do think images might maybe speak better than words, but this is just to illustrate a lot of the experiments we've done with colorways, um, materials and shapes of garments um, with lace stitches and drawing and patterns besides the whole like, presentation of the identity of the brand. Um, and these things are the result of co-designing. So as I said, like a process of going back and forth. And, you know, I learned lace making from Grassimar and practice it in my studio and then brought back different materials that we don't, we're not familiar with in Brazil. And we played with different materials for like months, almost like a full year with different um, women in the community. and. You know, some of them liked it, some of them were really excited about it, some of them were like, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, I don't, don't want to be near this. And that's absolutely fine. I think that's kind of the relationship that keeps the craft alive and um, going. I also just want to share a little bit of a spoiler of our upcoming collection that's finally launching, launching next week because <laughs> it's taken so long. Um, but yeah, we have um, some examples of lace that's coated with organic latex that is sourced from the Amazon rainforest with communities of rubber tappers that work there. So that's really exciting. Um, that's just a little video of like our first trials and samples with the, the, the latex liquid. For those who don't know, latex is like, it comes from trees, it's actually a liquid and you tap that out of the tree and you process it and eventually dries and becomes latex as we know it. Um, so anyway, I'm excited about this work because it's like an experiment of cross-pollination of different traditional crafts in different parts of Brazil and kind of, you know, making connections between these communities. Um, yeah, so in that I say, you know, I think craft and lace making are part of our present and are part of the future. And my approach to it in co-designing is really understanding artisans as inhabitants of the modern world who are active makers of their identities, who have the right to uh, play and taste, like and try and reshape their traditions as they seem fit, because traditions are alive, craft is alive, and we're constantly creating it. Um, and that does not mean but by by the way, at all, that I'm here to replace other types of lace making through my work. This is just an addition to other practices. And um, I also do not speak on behalf of Brazilian lace or, you know, or the lace makers that I work with. I think it's important to highlight, and I think we do that a lot in anthropology, just my positionality as a contributor and collaborator who is using the position of privilege I have to connect these women to other places and to other people. Um, and because I don't think I should be the only person speaking today, um, I just wanted to share a video 
um, that's part of like a docu-series I've been launching where you get to hear some of the voices of lace makers about their own craft. And I mean, you can see more again on the website and Instagram, but yeah, that's. Olé, mulher ribeira, olé, mulher ribeira, tu me ensina a fazer renda, que eu te ensino a mamãe. Lá fui, já fui, viu a serra, com 18 canas, foi buscar mulher ribeira pra renda no dia. Olé, mulher ribeira, olé. Olé, mulher ribeira, olé, mulher renda, tu me ensina a fazer renda, que eu te ensino a mamãe. Lá fui, já fui, viu a serra, com 18 canas, foi buscar mulher ribeira pra renda no dia. Olé, mulher ribeira, olé, mulher renda. Então, pra fazer a renda, a gente precisa da almofada coberta de chita, o tecido, a almofada de com palha de bananeira. Só precisa procurar né, a palha da bananeira quando está seca, ela serve para encher a almofada. E usa-se os bilros, esse aqui os bilros, a linha, espinho de mandacaru, que é a forma de prender a renda, prende o ponto. Usamos alfinete também, mas o certo é o espinho de mandacaru, que ele não tem a facilidade de enferrujar nem estragar nada. Então, aqui, 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 aqui. Comecei a fazer renda com 7 anos de idade. Eu já tenho 68 anos, faz 61 anos do pai. Aprendeu já com a mãe dela. Aí vem assim, de geração de mãe, vem da geração de geração, e vai passando de mãe para filha. Aí eu já aprendi, passei para minha filha, só que ela não quer. É, eu aprendi com a minha mãe. Então foi assim, é, de boa vontade. Ela fazia, minha avó fazia, daí a gente mocinha tinha que aprender, né? Tinha que seguir o ofício. Eu prefiro vender a renda. Né, eu trabalho aqui como vendedora, porque é um trabalho maravilhoso que, que não é tão valorizado. Porque ela disse que acha que isso daqui não é futuro, não tem futuro. Nem todo mundo dá valor, a gente faz uma peça por 10, a gente já acha caro. Aí ela acha que não tem futuro, e ela não faz. Eu não tenho paciência de concluir uma peça. Minha avó começou a fazer, começava a fazer renda, minha avó criou vários filhos, ela fazendo renda, meu avô na, na, na agricultura. E a minha mãe, eu lembro que a minha mãe, ela fazia renda à noite na novela. Eu criei com meus filhos fazendo renda, mas não só foi minha renda, a renda do meu marido, mais a mim. Por quê? Porque eu me dediquei, né? Fazer também, você tem que gostar de fazer. Também tem isso, se você não gostar de fazer, não, não, não serve de nada, tá entendendo? Isso aqui vai indo, vai indo, isso aqui tem que acaba. Porque nós velhas estamos indo e as mais novas não querem ficar fazendo. Eu acredito que vai ter um tempo que vai acabar. Porque as gerações novas, elas não, não focam, não querem, querem estudar, querem passear, né? Acham bonito, mas não tem estrutura de estar sentada ali fazendo. Na verdade, a gente queria era namorar. <risos> A gente não pensava nem em fazer renda. É de ano namorado que quer fazer renda, mas... Eu namorei muito rápido, muitos anos com esses pauzinhos aqui, aí eu esqueci de ter namorado. Eu aprendi, mas aí a minha mãe me colocava para me vender a renda que ela fazia na época. E a gente saía na beirada da praia oferecendo, né? Com a caixinha na cabeça oferecendo a renda. Isso tudo a gente mocinha. E com o tempo eu aprendi foi a, a, a vender. E a prática de vender 
Porque eu não tinha mais vergonha. É trabalho uma blusa que a gente vende de 130 reais. Eu acredito que essa blusa era pra ser 400 reais. E tem gente que ainda acha caro. Tem pessoas que acham que ah, tá muito caro, mas não entende o trabalho da gente. Você passar quatro dias pra fazer uma bandeja, pra vender por 15 reais, Aí ela vê que ele não dá. Ela precisa estudar, precisa fazer faculdade. Cadê? Com esse ganho aqui não dá para fazer. Um vestido a gente passa um mês para fazer. Para vender por 130 reais. Para você ver, né? Nós ainda estamos fazendo. Enquanto eu for viva, eu vou fazer ela, né? Tá todo mundo assim, tudo legal, tudo legalizado, dentro do de, desconforme da lei. É mais fácil de receber o turista, é mais fácil de receber encomendas, quando vem de vida, se a encomenda para todas. É, não, aqui é muito importante. Aqui a gente ganha dinheiro, aqui a gente mostra o nosso trabalho para as pessoas, aqui a gente divulga muita coisa. Então, o complexo artesanal foi, um, um, foi muito bom para todo mundo. Eu gosto de fazer. Eu gosto de fazer a renda. Adoro fazer renda. Sabia? Gosto demais. Desde, desde sete anos que eu começo, eu gosto. Eu gosto de fazer. Não, não dá, não, não gosto, mas eu gosto. A gente quer mostrar o nosso trabalho para o cliente. A gente quer que a renda de Deus ela não morra, que ela continue. Esse é o que a renda nunca deixa de existir. Mesmo essa dificuldade toda das, mais, da, da, das filhas, das netas não querer, mas sempre vai ter alguém que sabe fazer. Se você estiver em qualquer lugar, ele do Ceará, ah, eu queria tanto ver uma almofada, você fazer bico, sempre vai ter alguém para fazer. Eu acredito nisso, que sempre vai ter. Não vai ter renderes assim, é, tipo, para se do sustento, mas vai ter sempre alguém que vai dizer assim, eu sei fazer renda. Só penso em namorado, e o dia cedo já tá sentada, dormindo com o filão, sonhando acordado, seu pai é o doutor, sua filha. Nem estuda, nem dorme, nem faz nada. Ela só quer, só pensa em namorado. Só pensa em namorado, não pensa mais nem renda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Anna. That was also really interesting. And um, I'm jotting down many thoughts that are coming into my head. I mean, I think there was definitely sort of a through line or a you know, connection between um, some of what Kasuni talked about and what you talked about. Um, and also just thinking about sort of, you know, why we wanted Elena's contribution, our exhibition, you know, to give voice to these women who historically didn't have one um, and how you're doing that in this video and through your work. I mean, it's really um, very inspiring. So um, thank you very much. Uh, we will take a short coffee break. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lily Homer. I'm an artist and researcher from Chicago. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share knowledge about a metallic lace called Spanier Arbit with you today. Thank you so much to the Bard Graduate Center for, for having me. Uh, I'll be covering some of the history of the technique, uh, why it's considered unique to other laces, how it's made, its status as a commodity today, uh, and um, our journey to learning this information, despite a lack of published research on the lace up to this point. My research partner, Elena Solomon, and I were contracted to write an entry for the upcoming Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of World Textile entry on Spanier Arbit, and we believe this will be the first English encyclopedia entry on Spanier Arbit, and we're just so excited to get this information out there for more people to learn and to appreciate this beautiful work. So. Um, thank you to those who are involved for that opportunity as well. 
a lot of what uh, I'll explore today comes from the research and synthesis we did for that project. I'll be reading some excerpts directly from our entry as well. I'll also note that much of our research uh, has found conflicting information with a variety of explanations and definitions for some things. We've done our best to synthesize the possibilities and expect our information on the details and the history of the technique will continue so to sort of evolve, to change and update. Spanier Arbet is an Ashkenazi Jewish lace technique. It's been used mostly to decorate a variety of Jewish ceremonial and daily clothing items, most frequently the Achere uh, prayer shawls, which, um, where it serves as an embellished neckband. You can see this type of swatch here on the left uh, for kippahs, a Jewish cap like the one on the right here, the lace is built in six triangles and sewn together. The kittel, a funeral shroud, was sometimes also adorned with spanier arbit on the collar and on the cuffs. A variety of other religious items uh, were adorned with spanier arbit as well. The brestuch, uh, women's breastplate, uh, like the three in this picture, uh, also provided a prominent display uh, of the valuable lacework. Uh, while Spanier Arbit has always been worn by Jews, uh, it's also considered uh, exclusive to Ashkenazi Jewish production historically, and has also been seen as a voidish coitus, uh, sacred work, by manufacturers in the past, it's still not an exclusively religious craft. There are no ceremonies surrounding its production, no blessings stated before commencing and making it, and no explicit restrictions on who can produce it or who can wear it. Despite this, uh, there's very little public information on how it's made. Information about materials, sourcing, process, and tools are very scarce. Um, while this used to be the result of its cultural status as a religious practice, that seems no longer to be the case. Today, the secrecy of the technique has more to do with its status as a protected trade secret with high earning potential and the isolation of its makers uh, than more so than a religiously guarded practice per se. My research partner Elena and I were incredibly fortunate to be able to speak with a current practitioner, Bels Chassid Rabbi Yosef Grunwald. Elena joined him in his home in Ashdod and I joined via Zoom. Many of the photos I'm sharing with you today are from that visit and we are just incredibly grateful to Rabbi Grunwald for allowing us into his home and for showing us his trade and for, for allowing us to share what we learned with even more people. Rabbi Grunwald has uh, developed some designs of his own, working from original pattern books and altering them to his preferences and to the styles of his buyers. Spanier Arbet is constructed on a four-legged wooden loom. A table-like structure sits at waist height with a rectangular vertical frame on top. The frame has four hooks secured and hanging down uh, and is known in Yiddish as a gorn. A rotating drum, loosely referred to in Yiddish as a Spanier Rettel or a Spanier Wheel, sits on top of the freestanding base. The drum and additional material are covered in fabric, which historically included rags or straw, um, and today often consists of foam, rags, or a combination of the two, are stuffed into a pillow called a kishel or a kishla, meaning cushion, uh, then a paper pattern, either drawn or printed, measuring slightly wider than the intended lace itself, is attached to the pillow. Spanier Arbet is made by working three fibers, two thin silver wires and one silver plate, around a set of inner passive thick core threads. Nowadays, cotton or polyester, uh, and two outer passive thinner metallic threads. Secured uh, to the pillow with pins on one end, the passive fibers feed through the hooks at the top of the frame with their bobbins hanging down behind the table to create an upward tension. And this is one of the things that makes this lace unique to other laces, is this sort of use of gravity and tension in the bobbins. Between passes of the plate around the thick core fibers, the maker entwines the silver wire along the edges of the new silver cord, pinning the new cord down to the pillow, following a printed pattern, and using a small crochet hook to secure the edges of the cord to itself as it snakes around the pattern. Wrapping the thicker fibers with the silver plate gives the lace its sort of puffy appearance, 
uh, while hitching the two thin metallic fibers to each side of uh, to each side with the two working wires stabilizes it and creates edges. All three working fibers are manipulated by wooden shuttles. The final ornate swatch is removed from the loom on which it was constructed and then sewn onto a garment as embellishment. Spanier Arbit's name is Yiddish, uh, and it carries a dual meaning of both spun work and Spanish work, which has been the cause for speculation in recent history because, um, well, among the limited scholarship and open practitioners, there's really no consensus. Um, the Spanish referent possibly suggests that it traveled with Sephardi Jews of Spanish Portuguese descent after their expulsion from the Ottoman Empire beginning around the late 16th century, though no material or recorded evidence to date supports this theory. More likely, it developed in eastern Galicia, specifically the Pale of Settlement, which is a region to which Jews were relegated in Eastern Europe from around the late 1700s to the early 1900s. It included the modern day areas of Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and the Western Russian Federation, among others. The name of my lecture today, Spanier Arbit Shtetlace, comes from this part of Spanier Arbit's history. Shtetls were small Eastern European towns that existed before the Holocaust. Their populations were predominantly Ashkenazi Jews. It's towns like these that help characterize the sort of cultural upbringing of Spanier Arbit. This image is from 2011. It shows Rabbi Yosef Grunwald working on the Gorn. A common myth surrounding the origin of the technique centers on a man named Mordechai Lieb Morgulis, who grew up in Berdyshev. As a youth, in order to, to escape conscription into the Russian army by the chappers or the kidnappers, uh, he escaped hidden in a wooden cart, transporting goods over the Russian border into Galicia, modern day Poland to the nearest town of Sasau uh, around 1830. According to the story, he smuggled silver threads in his pockets, taken from his father's workshop in Berdyshev, and he quickly built a loom and proceeded to make achures in Sasau, which is the location of the earliest known examples of Spanier Arbit. Margulis went on to create a workshop, um, and this is true, um, and maintained a monopoly over the business of handmade achures for decades uh, during the industry's peak uh, from 1860 to 1890. Beyond the city of Sasso, at the beginning of the 20th century, branches of the factory uh, were also operated in Lviv, uh, a contemporary lace uh, production center in Poland. Um, he, he maintained his monopoly so long by keeping his uh, producers and material sourcing and the process a secret. Um, eventually, um, he sourced materials from Weissenberg, Germany, Vienna, and Pressburg, Austria. Margulis also, we know, offered the equivalent of like, benefits and social security to his workers, um, but low wages resulted in labor strikes during the first decade of the 20th century. Spanier Arbit reached peak popularity in the late 19th century and declined dramatically since then. At its height, the metal lace was worn by many groups of Ashkenazi Jews in Eastern Europe, including Central Europe um, and the US uh, with the migration to the US. And today it's primarily worn by Hasidic Jews, which is an Orthodox branch of the Ashkenazi Jewish practice. Initially, the Sasa factories producing Spanier Arbit hired only Jewish men as artisans and incorporated Talmudic practices into their daily work. Uh, later on, though, production increased um, and demand increased um, and more labor was required, uh, so women were employed in the factories as well. Women, we know, have both produced and taught the trade, but the extent of their involvement um, in each era is still unknown, at least to me. Scholarship does generally agree that pat patrons of Spanier Arbit have historically been only Jews and that uh, non-Jewish consumption of the technique is limited at most. Um, awareness of the technique has extended beyond Jewish communities. Um, for example, in 1887, Achares from Sassau um, received an award at the International Exhibition in Vienna, which I find it really interesting. Um, in general, though, the technique is unknown outside Jewish communities and very um, and even sparsely known within the Jewish community. 
The achere work is understood as two sections. There's the center rectangle known as the spiegel, uh, which means mirror because it's often symmetrical, and the outer border known as the kassen or the box. The spiegel is done first, followed by the kassen around it. Uh, the two are connected with some additional silver wire using a crochet hook, um, and both are created with the backside facing outwards and the front of the work facing the pillow so that little mistakes can be easily hidden. Before the availability of polyester, the inner cords of Spanier Arbit were made with either cotton or flax linen. Flax linen uh, was more widely available, but also uh, it poses the problem of shotness, which is um, the prohibition of combining linen and wool in the same garment, uh, because tali seam, uh, the prayer shawls, were often made from wool. Certain groups of chassids either chose not to wear Spanier Arbit or opted for the cotton version. Spanier Arbit has always been a very high cost uh, embellishment. Handmade Spanier Arbit now in 2022 costs between one and $4,000 uh, per piece. The price of handmade Spanier Arbit um, is also impacted by how long it takes, how labor intensive it is, the production process, and also the materials are very costly. Uh, machine made Spanier Arbit today is widely available um, on the modern market online, and it costs a fraction of the price at around $100 per piece. Spanier Arbit um, is a tape lace. Um, that's how we've sort of been defining it. Um, it's similar to, but essentially different from all other types of lace. Um, as I mentioned, the internal passive threads, which are tensioned upwards, feed through hooks at the top of the gorn with their bobbins hanging down. Um, and three handheld shuttles do the passing and wrapping, uh, working away from the maker's body, also which is unique. Um, the joining of each strip to the neighboring strips to support the shape of the Spanier Arbit with crochet hooks uh, does indicate uh, influence from bobbin and tape laces. Spanier Arbit closely resembles lame splits, um, which is also known as lame lace. It's a lace traditional to southern Germany made uh, from metallic threads, which are wrapped around inner cords and stitched together um, in a looping pattern. The lace maker works from a pattern, um, which um, as you've heard earlier today, was um, historically drawn and designed by separate workers and it's a specialized skill. In Sasso, during the 19th century, students in the local yeshiva, which is a Jewish school for men, um, and both men and women um, um, in the community historically drew patterns for the Spanier machers, so the Spanier makers. Historically, certain symbols were used to show affiliation um, with certain groups. Um, specific sects. So different sects of Hasidim embraced different designs over others to self-identify. For example, the Rujine dynasty uh, was a rosette and the Sasso design uh, was heart-shaped. The designs currently used for Spanier Arbit remain very similar to those from the early years of production, um, though specific shapes don't seem to be used any longer to demarcate membership to a particular community. So today, Spanier Arbit is produced and purchased online and in stores and are marketed, marketed frequently as Giftlachten, meaning braided uh, in both Yiddish and German. Um, or they're also marketed as achereis, um, referencing the final product rather than the lace itself. Mass production of imitation Spanier Arbit has greatly affected the prevalence of the handmade versions um, and their aesthetic. Historically, information about how Spanier, made, Spanier Arbit was made, including both the technique and the source of the, thread, th source of th the threads, was largely safeguarded as proprietary. That's still true today. By contrast, machine-made imitation Spanier Arbit is now treated as the dominant commodity on the market, and any information about its production, even the name of the factories producing it overseas, is a protected trade secret as well. And it's not openly shared by Ju Judaica stores that sell them. Uh, today, within the, the handmade Spanier community, sourcing for metallic threads remains highly secretive, um, even in some cases between teacher and student. In the 19th and 20th centuries, it was quite common for Hasidim to own handmade Spanier Arbit individually. Its popularity demonstrated um, was is demonstrated by depictions in um, Spanier adorned achures in images of Jews in prayer um, on postcards and photographs and drawings and wood prints. The use of Spanier Arbit has declined since its peak in the 19th century and is now almost exclusively uh, produced to adorn achures and purchased by Hasidic Jews in two locations, Israel and New York City. 
both the process of creating Schweiner Arbit and the sourcing of proper materials remain protected secrets. Um, in recent decades, however, this is um, a critical point for me, more attention has been paid to reviving the technique and sharing it outside of the community. Um, notably, Jewish American artist Itza Aber uh, and the Pomegranate Guild of Judaic Needlework, um, which she co-founded in 1977, um, started producing more Spanier Arbit and publishing information about it. The Pomegranate Guild commissioned a documentary about Spanier Arbit in 2004, um, and the film shows examples of the lace as well as a clip, and this is a still from that, um, from an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Prague in 2002, where Rabbi Yosef Grinwald worked Spanier Arbit on the loom for mu museum goers. Examples of Spanier Arbit can be found in museum collections around the world, um, in Jerusalem, Krakow, London, and Prague, um, after the Holocaust with repatriation efforts. If the descendants of people murdered in the Holocaust couldn't be found, they would go to museum collections. Um, more cities include um, Lviv, Ukraine, Chicago, Washington, DC, and New York, among others. The samples I was able to view um, in New York in particular are, are at the Yeshiva University Museum, and I highly recommend you can go by appointment. We've also found a small handful of published sources mentioning or describing Spanier Arbit um, and are truly beyond excited uh, to be join, joining that group of public references with the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of World Textiles. So thank you for that. Uh, and um, there are also more references to the technique in other languages, particularly Polish, uh, which we hope to get translated in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. Where'd you go? There you are. Um, I know you said there's not much known, but I learned a lot <laughs> in, um, doing your presentation. It's really, really fascinating. Very, very, even more niche than we thought. You know, we keep talking about how niche lace is. Well, that's really niche, right? Um, so our last speaker um, uh, of the morning is Emma Welty. Uh, Emma Welty is an artist, researcher, and writer with a textile-centered studio practice. Welty completed a BFA at Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Fibers, and Art History, and an MFA, MA in Visual Art and Art History at Purchase College. Welty's work utilizes ancestral traditions of Armenian carpet and needle lace to explore greater economies of labor, notions of heirloom, and cultural transmissions within a digital diaspora. In 2021, Welty was in residence at the Museum of Art and Design, Museum of Arts and Design here in New York um, and I don't know if it was the same year, um, in, uh, at the Woodbury Public Library in Connecticut. Was it also 2021? Um, and, uh, she has shown at the, at Studio Hill Gallery, also in Woodbury, Piano Craft Gallery in Boston, and Joseph Gross Gallery at the University of Arizona. She has an upcoming show at the Newport Museum of Art in Rhode Island. Her talk is entitled, Shepherds of Needle Lace, Armenian Lace After the Armenian Genocide, excuse me, Armenian American Lace After the Armenian Genocide, 1915 to 1923. Please welcome Emma Welty. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm also really honored to get to go last because I feel like all of my work is now beautifully contextualized in all of these other practices, and um, I see so many uh, sort of interlocking narratives already. Um, I want to start with my sort of origin story in all of this. Um, my great grandmother was an Armenian lace maker um, and a refugee of the genocide. So she is in this photograph on the right in the back row in the middle uh, with the black tunic on. She was um, a, a very proficient Armenian needle lace maker as well as a teacher and um, she was displaced from her home during the genocide, uh, was ended up in a sort of like forced marriage for survival, uh, landed in um, a refugee uh, camp in Cairo where she taught a number of other refugees the, um, the lace technique. Uh, so technique. Um, so it was made in the home, it was made for the dowry, maybe, maybe adornments on early baby clothes. Um, another tradition was like, 
when a baby, a child would lose their first tooth, there would be a little pillow. I think Americans sometimes do this too. I'm not sure, but like um, there's a little pillow with a pocket in it, and they would adorn those things with lace. So it was like these big domestic like moments that were marked by this lace, um, but it was very much kept in the home. Um, it wasn't made for sale. It wasn't like admitted to the marketplace unless you were widowed, um, because if you tried to sell your work, your you know, father or husband or patriarch, how, who, you know, whoever it was, would have taken great insult to that as um, you trying to sell your work, meaning that they're not the provider. Um, so the lace was made, was kept out of the economy for a long time. And the lace's value was very much um, domestic and very much uh, a symbol of both cultural purity and marriageability and sort of the patience that would make a good domestic wife. Um, so when the Hamidian massacres occurred between about 1893 uh, and 5, um, a, a lot of the men, a lot of the patriarchs and the breadwinners were exterminated. So all of these women, as said in uh, Tashian's book, were left to their native skill with the needle to support themselves because they didn't have any other um, economic outlet. So at this time... A group of American missionaries, some through the Red Cross or other organizations, um, started these sort of cottage industries where they would have the displaced women and orphaned children make the lace, and then they would sell it to Americans to fund the very orphanages and refugee camps that these uh, women and children were in. Um, so it changed the shape of the lace quite a bit, and it also um, is the explanation for the title of this um, presentation, The Shepherds of Needle Lace, because the uh, two of the most prominent missionaries were named Fred and Francis Shepherd. Uh, they organized the American cottage industry or the Aintab cottage industries. Um, and there was a book written about them called um, The Shepherds of Aintab. So it was this very weird moment where they became these sort of like, um, like white savior missionaries to come in and like shepherd the technique out of uh, tragedy and out of national calamity uh, and uh, sort of into the American eye line. Um, but you can also see how drastically it changed the technique to be putting it into the marketplace because it went from the sort of, uh, you know, pieces on the pieces like the one on the right, which is a lifelong endeavor. I mean, that probably took a decade, if not more, to create that piece uh, on a highly sort of like fine level uh, versus things that could be made and sold quickly. They needed to be very small um, because, as I said, this is a knotted lace technique that is each knot is tied individually in the round. And when I was learning it, I was like completely stupefied by how long it would take like a piece like that. Um, size maybe like under an inch at that fine gauge could take hours easily. Um, so it really changed the shape of the, um, like the literal shape of the lace itself as it became part of this sort of philanthropy marketplace um, in the United States. Um, this was sort of spearheaded by the Near East Relief Organization, um, which is widely documented and has a gigantic archive of information. Um, and so they were doing this program, they called it, um, like, uh, it was support until 16 self-support after that. So they were taking these orphan children and trying to sort of, through an American lens, train them in their own ancestral techniques in order to then fundraise for the organization, sort of essentially to like, in exchange for their housing and food rations. Um, and then they were, the idea was it with this uh, training and in skills, including embroidery, lace making, garment making, um, carpet weaving, that they would be able to self-support by the time they were 16. Um, so this type of um, publication was really common. It was very well known in the United States at the time because um, both President Coolidge and Pre President Wilson um, were big proponents for the Near East Relief um, and would encourage Americans to um, to give, it was like golden rule Sunday. They would uh, take the money they would normally have a big Sunday meal and they would donate it to Near East Relief. And that was the kind of uh, ways that the American presidents were trying to encourage um, relief in this way. Um, but I have to show this image as like, it all sounds well and good to sort of support these displaced people, but it also smells a little bit of sweatshop. Um, so you see here, 
uh, these young women and girls um, with their, uh, you know, different handwork projects, embroidery, looms, whatever, all sort of huddled by the window, trying to get as much natural light as they could access. Um, but these things were like proudly marketed, uh, like, look how good they're doing, look how happy they're do they are to be making their lace. And, you know, we're keeping their ancestral traditions alive. Um, but at the same time, America and in, in England and Europe were um, just sort of like grossly mistranslating the technique. Uh, this is one of the most offensive things I came across, which is um, an article um, from the Chicago Tribune at the height of the genocide in 1916 that refers to the Armenian lace collar, first of all, incorrectly as embroidery. And then if you read the um, pattern, is actually not correct to the technique at all. It's a it's um, a different sort of buttonhole lace, like looped technique. Um, and so I started to realize, like, by looking through American sources, you were finding like ways that the technique was sort of tweaked into the techniques that the Americans already knew and they could easily translate through like a magazine or newspaper article. Um, not only was this incorrectly on a number of levels, like incorrectly translated or transcribed, um, it was also given no context that at this, at this moment, 1.5 million Armenians were being slaughtered and millions more being deported into the desert. So they just sort of like took this technique that was starting to bubble up and be more visible because of these relief organizations, but just used it for like a nice like Sunday afternoon craft that you could do. Um, as I was thinking about translation and mistranslation, I was also thinking in my own studio practice of um, the ways that the knot itself was translated. Um, I was struck, as I was doing this research, I was trying to learn the technique and I was struggling quite a bit with it um, because I was working from print sources and I started to really think about the abstraction of the tutorial language and the ways it relates to um, language and music, but also the ways that they become like completely abstracted shapes and almost give you no useful information about how to craft this lace. Um, again, like the tutorial language was like, you know, coming, coming to the forefront of my mind. I was thinking about these like zoomed in views of hands. Uh, this was coming into my studio even more. Um, when I did this project, which was um, a, a video where I, um, applied like I think eight coats of nail polish in different colors that my late mother would have worn and removed them with cotton pads that I had adorned with needle lace. Um, so this was my first step into using it really like in my own practice. Um, at the same time, still researching uh, the ways it was, it was being seen by the American audience, including um, the ways it was seen in these sort of ethnographic displays, such as the World's Fair, uh, the 1893 World's Fair being particularly significant as the sort of coming out party for like Turkish nationalism. You know, it's kind of the shift in, from Ottoman Empire to like Turkey and the ways that they were both exterminating but also flattening uh, these other ethnic groups and then utilizing uh, their own techniques. So in the Turkish pavilion were Armenian lace makers, Greek and Syrian dancers, all of these other culture producers that were literally being uh, like completely ethnic cleansed by the national Turkey Turkish agenda. Um, that sort of mode of like, um, sort of dog and pony show <laughs> uh, is still very much utilized um, and that there's a, a big history. I mean, I'm even a part of it of like going to your sort of local community centers and public libraries and like showing your skills and showing what you can do uh, and the, the connection to the culture. Uh, in uh, 2018, uh, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival included, um, it was an Armenian exhibition and they included um, Armenian lace makers, but interestingly, uh, only included Armenian lace makers in Armenia proper at the time, didn't include any um, Armenian diaspora artists. Um, so since, you know, the 1890s, uh, we also have moved into the space of, of the internet. And so the um, online spaces have become very fruitful for this type of work. And so as I was struggling with these print sources, as I mentioned, uh, this YouTube channel became really important to me because it was the first time I was able to see it live. Um, so YouTube has become like a really fruitful space for this type of needle lace. And um, if you looked at that time I was doing this research at the Instagram hashtag for Armenian needle lace, you see over and over and over again, the same pattern that was taught 
on this YouTube channel, Become Inspired, because it really points to how few resources we had to work with. Um, this is a collage I made with all of those things in mind, a tutorial language, um, digital language, uh, different points of access. And this is for a publication by the Armenian Creatives Group, which if you have any connection uh, to Armenian heritage, I highly recommend looking at their website. Okay, <laughs> so uh, just quick side note to set up the context for the last few slides. Um, the most famous Armenian Americans currently are Cher and Kim Kardashian. So the, the side research I was doing alongside of this was about their cultural production and the ways that their um, Armenian American identity set the stage for a lot of um, diasporic and assimilated Americans, including myself and my sister, who saw Armenian identity on television for the very first time while watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians with our mother. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna come back right back to this. Um, but uh, to again set the stage, uh, this is some of my other work that was happening at the same time, which is um, all about laundry. I was thinking, and this was uh, from a series that also included carpet and tapestry, um, but I was thinking about laundry, I was thinking about heirloom, I was in the pandemic, I couldn't go to the laundromat, I was washing all my clothes by hand uh, to avoid going out and getting sick. And so I really was meditating on the type of language that we find in our care labels and the ways it relates to the like more global understanding of textile value and labor. Um, so these are a couple of um, pieces from that series. And so I was doing this label work and I was thinking about bras, like that was where a lot of the labels I was reading were coming from um, intimate garments. And then um, Kim Kardashian released Skims. She actually originally released it as Kimono, which she trademarked, but the internet like eviscerated her for that, obviously. <laughs> and so she changed the name to Skims. Um, but then of course there was a little bit more up for uh, right after that when she released this label that says Made in Turkey. Um, so there was a lot of um, uproar on the Armenian internet. And then I sort of took it upon myself to um, write a letter to her, create a body of work that would address um, the sort of the problematics of abandoning uh, the textile legacy um, that is a part of your culture in favor of working with your oppressor. Um, so at that point, I was still making collage and I made this piece, which is combining a lot of my research. You've seen a lot of these images already in this slideshow, um, but sort of contextualizing Kim and her branding techniques alongside the sort of lace, Armenian lace matriarchs that were in my history, as well as some of the like, the problematic sort of Near East relief imaging of, of the way the lace was created and manufactured. Um, this is a piece, again, like referring to that like early moment of seeing Kim be representation um, in an early uh, earlier space when she first visited Armenia in, in 2015. Um, and so this piece on the right um, is a nod to that sort of still from, from that, uh, that show. Um, I would like to end though on a slightly different note. I know I mentioned earlier um, my relationship to the water and the sea and looking into the sort of net making uh, technique of it all. Um, but I also wanna note that when I uh, work with this material, it becomes very emotional for me. I have to really confront the history of this traumatic event over and over and over again. So as I've moved forward in my practice, I've started to uh, think about how to deposit a little bit of joy, a little bit of whimsy, um, a little bit more color. Um, and so I'm gonna end with this piece, which is um, <laughs> related to my work in my hometown. I wanted to take my uh, ancestral technique and cross it with like a very weird niche part of my sort of sense of place, which is like this very bizarre little piece of graffiti that's on the side of the grocery store in my hometown that says tuna. Um, so I made uh, this piece, tuna, um, because if you know also anything about net fishing, um, tuna being fished by nets is also very like ecologically fraught and complicated. Um, but at the same time, um, just a little bit of silliness, working with color, trying to sort of break with that idea that the lace needs to be white for the sake of purity and, and uh, virginality and all of these things. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with just a list of the resources if anybody wants to learn the technique. This is the route that I took. 
Um, and then lastly, a list of um, places where you can support uh, displaced Armenians currently. Um, and my favorite uh, that I support is Kui Riggs, which supports um, displaced families and pregnant individuals who have lost their homes due to the recent Azeri aggression. So thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. That was really great. And um, again, I think it's sort of, you know, touched on a lot of things that, that have been brought up this morning. Um, but also, uh, and I think, I mean, really, the, the, talk, the four talks were so great. And as Emma and I wanted very much um, in terms of this symposium to really go, you know, far beyond the boundaries of Europe and, and uh, you know, to learn these different histories. Um, and about lace in, in different parts of the world. So we're going to set up for um, Q&A. Thank you all so much. Um, while everyone in the audience gets their questions ready, um, we just had a wonderful information about Emma, how you learned lace making. But I wonder if the rest of you too could speak about um, where you learned your lace making, or lace making skills or your textile skills um, in thinking about this sort of... Um, passing skills down through family or the secrecy involved in certain lace making techniques? Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so I learned bobbin lace with um, Grassi Mar, who is a dear friend of mine and lace maker that I spoke about in my presentation. Um, I lived with her in the village for about like a month and a half um, at her home and participated in her like day-to-day -day life and family life and got really embedded in the social context of where that lace gets produced. And it was just really a privilege to learn not just the technique in itself, but everything around it and all the relationships around it. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I learned um, needle lace from my grandmother when I was really young and a little bit of crochet. But at that time, I had no idea what I was doing. You know, it was just grandmother's teaching. Um, and then lately, when I went to design school, that I realized that um, there's this importance of handmade lace and craft. So I was originally from the southern coastal region where the Portuguese and Dutch arrived. Um, so I have been seeing this craft. And then I wanted to do a project with this bobbin lace. Um, as you saw, some of the ladies who are from the lace center, from them I learned bobbin lace. So um, I prefer needle lace because I feel like more control over, but then I work with bobbin lace as well. Um, all my work that I've been incorporating bobbin lace. I actually just want to add a little shout out because you know that I learned it mostly from YouTube University and from all of those print sources, but um, I was just speaking with Elena about another uh, lace making uh, matriarch named Susan Lynn Sananian at the Armenian Museum of America in Watertown, Massachusetts. And I actually traveled there while I was in the middle of uh, researching and I brought like a little hanky filled with like tiny little doilies I had been working with. And she looked at them and was like, oh no, like you're doing it wrong. This is how you're doing it. You're doing it backwards. And like, she showed me the right way and like sent me home with a bunch of like photocopies of tutorials. And so I just wanted to shout her out. She was actually a student of Kaspari and the person who uh, wrote that book that I also worked from as well. So I do not know how to make Spanier Arbit. Um, <laughs> um, maybe I'll learn one day. Um, Rabbi Grunwald has been incredibly generous um, letting us into his home and letting us photograph him working. Um, so if we do, you know, pursue um, sort of like if he's willing to teach us in the future, possibly. But at this point, I do some Bob and Lace, which I also learned from YouTube. Um, and uh, I learned uh, needle tatting from the School of Needlework and Design in San Francisco. Well, I just want to thank all of our amazing speakers first before talking about myself. We've all been in touch either in person or online for many years, and I just was delighted to meet you all today. Um, and, you know, for me, I first studied lace making in um, Idria, Slovenia, which I am not even remotely Slovenian in my background, but in 2011, there were very little resources online to learn to make bobbin lace. And I 
failed to teach myself from YouTube or books. So I Googled lay school and the first school that came up that had a website in English and that seemed to offer classes in bobbin lace was in Slovenia. So I just sort of showed up in 2012 to their lace festival and said, hi, can someone teach me to do this? And they were like, who are you from New York? It, it was very strange. Um, so I, I, is this working? Yeah. Testing? Okay. Good. Um, I, I have random questions um, that I noted down. But um, so one that I have is for um, um, for Anna. Um, we were saying that in, in Brazil, the the technique of bobbin lace is now considered essentially Brazilian, and I was um, and I was wondering when that happened in the you know in the course of its history um, in that region, um, and also if you could talk a little bit more about how the patterns are. Are they published? Are they passed down from one designer to another? I mean, how do they circulate the patterns? Yeah, so in terms of it being considered essentially Brazilian, I'm sure that there are like Brazilian lace historians that do, do justice to the origins of lace. But um, within just like the day-to-day -day of the, the communities and, um, you know, through my field work, I spoke to a few government officials that are in charge of cultural tourism in the area and there's no like official discourse around the origins of like they will mention that it came from the portuguese or the dutch but it's a very vague mention and when i was interviewing most lace makers um and i asked oh does lace connect you to a past which past they will always say oh yes to my mother they never mention like oh yeah to the europeans from hundreds of years ago. So I do not know when that started or why that is so, but I just find it very interesting coming from like an academic background and seeing and knowing where lace comes from and, you know, and, and then being in the villages and being that, seeing that that's not the history people choose to connect with. Yeah. And, oh, and you had another question that was for the lace patterns. Yeah. The, I mean, just because we have pattern books in the exhibition, but I, uh, I don't, suppose there are pattern books there that people are working from but are they so, I mean, so how uh, i know that you you collaborate right with your um i've forgotten her name but your yeah, mother, but, um, who creates patterns yes um so are there there are just people now working like that who you know in the community who who create patterns and so and borrow from one another or or how is that how does that work in akiraz i know that there is grasimar and there's another woman she's um quite poor now with her health so I don't know if she's still um, drafting but it was a few years ago when I visited she was um I do not I have never witnessed anyone drafting a pattern out of books or anything like that I have seen Gressamar look up things on YouTube here and there <laughs> out of like curiosity and then just like receiving lace from a different state a different town right. and then right. like the way they do it, they place the lace on the pillow and then they prick mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the, they use cardboard for it mm -hmm. and then they redraft it on the pricked paper. Mm -hmm. So it's, I guess it's like, it's an informal way of right. copying the right. patterns. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I just, oh, sorry. If I may. I'll hold mine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, no, I just wanted to add that I think all of your talks today really highlighted the fact that although these traditions, some of them perhaps originate from European traditions, that textiles like globally throughout history have been an, a cultural exchange and many textiles that we consider mm -hmm. European are not originally from Europe, like silk weaving originated in China, for example. And, you know, we wouldn't question that velvet is part of Italian tradition, that it is, an, you know, a native tradition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though these techniques are transmitted, I think really all these talks are a testament to the fact that this is a Brazilian technique. It's not a European technique. And that's what's so wonderful about it. So, sorry, not a question, a comment. But. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> um, do we have questions from the audience? If not, I have another. Yeah, Mary. Thank you for um, today's talks. I had a question for Emma. You, there was one slide where you talked about the exhibition, I think at the Smithsonian Folk Art Museum, and you mentioned um, that they didn't really uh, necessarily engage with the diaspora. 
So I was wondering if you could talk more about that. What is the significance um, of the diaspora in these uh, practices? And also, what is the connection um, with the community at home? Thank you. Um, yeah, that was um, an interesting little bit of the research because it was it was the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. It was like a several day festival, um, and that that um, year, I think 2018 was they were specifically looking at Armenia, and I just thought it was so interesting that they were they were either bringing in um, practitioners from Armenia, which again is very complicated because it's such a small window into that sort of Anatolian like world um but they you know they were bringing like video in from different people teachers um and you know it was like translated and and dubbed and it was interesting that like they they were not you know at least from what i saw um bringing in any like american practitioners into the conversation at the smithsonian i thought that was so interesting um and so it was um, probably, to be honest, a matter of like there, there ha there's not much visibility um, for this technique in the diaspora beca because of one of those reason other reasons I cited, which is that like it was always held behind closed doors. It was always like mm -hmm. this is a thing that you do for your family, for your dowry. It also became a symbol of cultural purity. It became a thing of like, okay, we're doing this at home. And if you're doing it at home and you're keeping it at home and you're keeping it within the generations, like you're not really um, letting outside influence impact it. And so it felt, a, for me, it felt a little um, uh, sort of poignant that it was like, okay, they, they felt the need to sort of pull the the lace making tradition right out of the Republic as if that's the sort of purest form of it. Um, and meanwhile, you know, more and more, there are people throughout the diaspora. My knowledge is very limited to English language sources, but you know, globally, I'm sure I know in Russia, there's a big um, Armenian needle lace culture there as well. Um, and, but these things are just like sh shape, shifted a little bit from the sort of pure white lace doily that we're used to. And, and so I don't necessarily like, I'm not coming for the Smithsonian necessarily about this, but I do feel like there is that little sense of like, well, we're going to get it in its most pure form from the source versus like seeing the ways that it has been impacted, moved and shaped by the very nature of diaspora, by the very nature of having to take your needle and tuck it in your pocket and leave with nothing. Like the ways that that has shaped the technique, the way that the American lens and the European lens has shaped the technique has made it, that's why I called my talk um, Armenian American Lace because I wanna be clear that it's becoming its own identity. Um, and so I do think um, it's a, a place where we moving forward can find more scholarship, can find more community um, as we see it as a, as a diasporic relationship. Thank you. Thank you. May, maybe. Thank you all for these eye-opening presentations. I'm very interested in Kasuni and Anna's thoughts about these uh, uh, dimensions of natural environment in the lace making tradition. Uh, Kasuni mentioned is still fishing and those profession, those trade associated with the natural environment, and then this um, similar rhythmic. Um, activities and is uh, and Anna's talk mentioned is um, the lace pillow was made of uh, dry banana and then the bobbin made of coconut shell and those dimensions. I wonder if all of you can comment more on this um, lace making tradition incorporating nat natural environments or um, immediate living environment. Yeah, for sure. Um, that is one of the things that really drew me to bobbin lace is how the materiality of the very tools of the trade translate its its history and its existence. Um, and you know, it, it, when it comes to the environment, like the piece of lace, like seeing that piece of lace on garment or elsewhere. It really doesn't tell the full story because there's a whole context where that lace is produced. Um, it, the villages, the uh, I know a lot of these women are um, 
married and they're like taking care of their children their children are playing around the lace pillow the husbands work in as fishermen or um, as farmers and they contribute and I think it's through this daily life and motion that the natural materials got incorporated it's just more practical to fill your lace pillow with what you have there at your disposal than to like buy some random stuffing you know fabric so I think people are have been very resourceful and also there's a le- element of um really like um a poverty in a lot of these areas so people have to be resourceful with what they have like a lot of women told me they try to work with pins but they go rusty because they're working by the seaside and they can't afford to keep buying pins so they use the thorns because it will last longer and that's sort of yeah the, the materiality of the relationship well, when it's come to uh, bobbin lace in Sri Lanka, obviously that ha- doesn't have much of an impact to the environment. Um, they use wooden bobbins and then the frame and the bobbin, the structure is very simple. Um, one of the things happened um, with the open economy and when the, the industrialization that most of the people started um, going to factories and there's this huge apparel exports industry. But still, um, the Sri Lankan apparel exports industry also very ethical. That Marks and Spencer, when they wanted to go ahead with Plan A, the sustainability plan, they picked Sri Lanka because it's known to be one of the um, the vendors or the South Asian um, country which was known for these organic practices. So I feel like that in the country, there's something that it's like a kind of a DNA and default. Um, well, obviously the lace making doesn't have much of an impact. And that was one of the reasons that I always wanted to connect with this sustainability and the climate change movement. So most of the craftsmanship has that, is that there are, there are lesser impact to the environment. Echoing everyone else, thank you for these presentations. And I hope that this question (laughs) is coherent. But I'm struck by um, the tension between lace as a social activity and a solitary activity because there it seems like and and the way that it's taught, you know, as each of you were talking about how you learned the different techniques. working with another person or working in community and and different lace makers working together, um, you know, what impact that has sort of on the evolution and transmission? I don't know if this is making sense (laughs) as a question, but, um, you know, it's really hard to learn it from pattern books, right? It it needs to be transmitted through a kind of teacher-student relationship, it seems. And and that, um, you know, feels like a cross- this is happening in all of the places that you, all of the different regions that you're representing. So I don't know if you could, some of you could speak more to that um, component. I did a, a lot of the work solitary, partly because like I didn't have a matriarch to learn from necessarily in my life. And also partly because I did a lot of this research during the pandemic. Um, So a lot of this work was literally made like during quarantine. Um, And I did find that the, the closest thing to having a teacher was like being able to rewind a video and like being able to be like, can you repeat that again? Just like scroll back 30 seconds. And so it, it, that was sort of how I like had a stand in teacher at that moment, because I, I really had no other um, access when I was doing this writing and doing this, this exploration. So it does create a sort of bizarre relationship to it when you're working alone, although that is sort of the way that the, the model that the patriarch had part patriarchy had set up. Um, But I I do think that the the internet has created the sense of community that I really needed. um, And I was able to connect with other um, Armenian artists and makers through the process of doing this, that did create this virtual community that made it, much um, more fruitful to teach and learn the technique over a screen. 
Yeah, I also want to comment on these. Um, first of all, on making lace on your own versus making lace with people. And all like women I've spoken to and interviewed in Akira's, you like there's such a variety of preferences. Like some women like to do like lace in in the center with their friends during the daytime and that's a more like casual work versus the lace that they make at night at home in their own lace pillows while watching tv in their solitude and that's a there's a completely different work that they allocate for the different places some of them will prefer only doing it at home others will prefer just only doing it in community but um with the passing down i also find it very interesting because of course, there's a, a narrative, and it's very true that these things are passed down from mother to daughter and so forth. And there's a beauty of this lineage of knowledge. But in a lot of places I've been, a lot of the women were like, I didn't want to learn this. My mom made me do it, <laughs> you know, which I find it's endearing. And it is also part of the history. Like sometimes, you know, it's not necessarily it wasn't your choice, but you learn it. A lot of them, they have this love hate relationship with lace we're like i didn't really want to do this but i learned it and now i am addicted to it and now i survive off of it so i have to do it but it's also my hobby and it's also my community sees me and that's where i get respect from so there's all these different layers of love and hate with the practice that are, are beautiful and complex as they should be and yeah i to honor that Yeah, I don't know. Well, I know uh, early on with the Spanier Arvid practice, men would be working in a factory or um, in their schools together, sort of between prayer or um, reflecting on prayer as they were working. Um, in my own practice, I guess, yeah, learning YouTube um, in just my own studio uh, has just been the most convenient way. But I do know that historically, at least in the cultures that I've studied, when women are crafting um, and if they are otherwise not permitted or it's not culturally acceptable to gather uh, alone in groups of just women, um, if there's a reason to be there, such as lace making or crafting in some other way, that's a, um, a reason um, and a more like, culturally acceptable way to gather in private um, and then be able to create that community um, where otherwise they would be pretty isolated. Um, so it's sort of a, yeah. It's a, it's a method of um, gathering, sort of, you know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So, well, I guess that um, lace making is such a tacit knowledge transferring from one generation to another. And if you really want to do something that you have to physically engage in, you know, virtual platforms are great. It's like swimming. You know, you cannot do a tutorial and you just unless you just really jump to the waters um, so I feel like if you really want to be good in lace making or any craftsmanship it makes more sense to just have that physical presence and that's what I've realized and I've seen that experience that most of the lace makers that I work uh, at least 45 years and above so they you know they have their own expertise and own shortcuts and own ways of doing so it would be really nice if you can personally engaging in that i think oh go ahead elena i i have a question actually That's i think okay. after that we're have, we'll have to wrap up so go oh. ahead i don't mean to take the last no, question no, but <laughs> okay um i think all of you have touched upon in different ways the sort of complex um, discourse around craft and labor and sort of the complexities of producing something so labor intensive that was traditionally paid so little. Um, and I wondered, as all of you in your own ways are working to give agencies back to these practitioners in a really amazing way, um, historically and contemporary practitioners, um, if you could speak to sort of, I think probably a lot of consumers grapple with, you know, sustainability and, and buying handmade versus, you know, not quite understanding why things cost what they do. Um, if you had a message for consumers or for the public to understand like what is behind these things and, and how they should approach buying handmade textiles and, and that sort of thing. That's sort of a big question, but... <laughs> Can I just say that? So, I mean, just to follow, because I was thinking about 
all of you talked in some way about the economics of this. Um, and so the, I was going to ask if you could sort of expand on that because it really is, it, it, it's, you did all, you know, address it in one way or another and, and, and you don't know how you each think about it or how it impacts what you're doing in terms of your work. Um, and I was also thinking about, you know, um, Anna, the, the women who were saying, well, my, you know, the daughter, my daughter doesn't want to do this anymore, you know, because she doesn't make any money and thinking about what we read, you know, in the 19th century that women realized they could make more money going to factories you know, than sitting at home and making lace. So yeah, the economics is also really interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, on the topic of economics, there's just like so much to say, especially if like, if like I have a business that is, you know, running on this kind of relationship and labor. Um, there is definitely like an ongoing concern about the longevity of the practice, at least the way it's done today, because it is really hard to make it economically viable. Um, it's, you know, it's, I, my advice for people that are interested in sustainable fashion is obviously like know your producer, do your research, you know, um, don't trust anyone that makes you like extreme promises. Like this is a hundred percent sustainable. Like, no, it never is going to be, you're always making compromises. So like, look for the people that are being honest about what's going on because really it's it's really hard from my personal experience like i find it's an interesting anecdote um when i started working in the villages obviously i pay a fair price for the labor and for the work and then there were other local lace makers not directly linked to the women i was working with that were starting to get angry because they they were people from the area but they commissioned things from those lace makers and now that they were being paid more they were like, well, you're ruining our local business because now, like, you know, you're kind of like inflating the lace market. And so, and, and I'm not um, here to blame those people. They're also Brazilians living by the coastal town, also have had family businesses with lace. So it is very complex. There's no like good and bad guy or a perfect way of doing it. There's just a lot of conversation and compromise all the time. Well, at the end of the day that I am in business of fashion, so it's important for me to um, create products in terms of preserving this craft. Um, my idea was to how to preserve a craft. Obviously, you have to incorporate them in contemporary platforms. And then when creating clothing, the only place that I do not negotiate is with the lace wheel makers. Uh, they are the one who decides the price. And if you think that um, the curb products are has, has this a certain price tag um, that because we are very fair uh, by what we pay for our, our craftswomen and the artisanal um, materials. And the also the thing that we talk about sustainability and the climate change and everything, the less consumption is the best way to look at things. So if we want to consume more, then we can, the people will create these products which doesn't have a quality and value. And if you really want to purchase carefully um, and be conscious about it, I think we can change this and we can pay better and we can pay well these artisans. I want to actually just step a little bit outside of the lace world when I say that I think it's important to remember that every single garment you own, no matter where you bought it, is handmade in some way. And I think that as much as we are like sometimes really have the impulse to like throw away every bit of like you know unsustainable fast fashion that we have and replace it with something sustainable the most sustainable thing that is in your wardrobe is the thing that you already own and so caring for like that was what inspired that work about care labels partially is that caring for your fast fashion garments with the same way that you would care for your heirlooms um is also a path through this and um really remembering that that the the shirt that you buy at Target is not machine made entirely just because it's less money. It's less money because of just like complete human right, rights violations, one. And it's also the the whole narrative that leads to this question, which is the suppressed perceived value of textiles, which comes from the larger culture of, of gender, 
um, as well as the sort of more ephemeral, like it's not going to last as long as like metal or glass or these other crafts. Um, but I think it's really important to just remember that caring for any garment you own with love and with like an intention to have a long-term relationship to that garment is the most sustainable thing that you can do. Yeah, I would also add, I think something that links us here today and also just links crafts in general is that people pass down information uh, by word of mouth. Things aren't necessarily documented um, in the way that we think of that word today. Um, and I think that also extends to maintaining what you already have um, and passing those down to other people, whether I, I'm a big advocate of trading clothes with friends when you don't want the garment anymore. This was my mom's from high school and I literally mended on the plane over here. Um, so yeah, learning how to mend and also, um, yeah, I think that, that um, Emma put it really well, you know, what you already have, uh, maintaining what you already have is the most sustainable practice in terms of consumption. So. Uh, yeah, and I think that it, it goes for the literal creation, the ability to continue creating the um, specific uh, lace practices that we've talked about here today. So, yeah, you're doing a favor for uh, your, also your descendants as well when you do that. Okay, so with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for all of your presentations, and thank you for joining us today.